Good evening, guys. This is Pastor Jesse again coming to you from Centro Cristiano Manuel here in San Angelo, Texas. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the study. I hope you're getting something out of it. I want to remind you uh, that we have our services uh, here at our local church. On Sundays, we have prayer at 9 o'clock and then regular service at 10 o'clock. We also have services on Wednesday. We have our 6 o'clock prayer and our 7 o'clock Bible study in the annex. Our Bible study is mostly in Spanish, so we welcome all of our Spanish and our bilingual speakers to join us. Our English speakers, of course, you can join us if you like. If not, we are continuing our English Bible study here online on YouTube and on Facebook. Every Wednesday at 6 o'clock, these studies will get posted uh, so that you can uh, continue getting blessed and continue getting ministered to. Uh, I want to remind everybody again of our book. It is The Life and Teachings of Christ. Uh, we have the description and the link to purchase the book down below. The book will be helpful for you to follow along and to understand uh, all the, the background and the setting and, and just a lot of details that you may not get from the actual study. Uh, I mean, from the from the study online, but you will get it from the book. I also want to remind you that when you click on this book, uh, on the link that we've provided below, it's going to look different because the graphic is different. The cover has been updated, but nonetheless, it is the same study, the same book. I encourage you to go get that. If you don't want to get it from Faith in Action, you can also get it from Global University. Once again, this is the Global University version. It's the same book and the same study, but Global University also offers uh, student handbooks, so that way it's a supplement uh, to your textbook and to the scriptures. Uh, it'll just help you work out your thoughts, and as you examine the scriptures and examine the study, I encourage you to go ahead and get that as well. So we're moving along here to part three. Uh, again, I mentioned that I wanted to keep these studies at around the 30-minute mark, so that way you could take these in pieces uh, a little bit at a time and process a little bit at a time. We are going through a lot of scripture. We're reading a lot and examining a lot of scripture. And so I just want you to have the time that you need to examine uh, uh, the scriptures and the study at your capacity, at your speed, at your uh, um, leisure. And so uh, lesson three, we've broken up into three parts. And this is the third part of lesson three. Three. I want to remind you, we're in Unit 1, Chapter 1, Lesson 3, The Early Years of Jesus. The Early Years of Jesus. We are looking at a lot of scriptures, uh, and we have already gone through uh, all of those scriptures, and I explained a little bit to you about what kind of popped out, what kind of jumped in my spirit. And so now we're going to talk about the textbook, and we're going to look at what the textbook said and some of the things uh, in there that I find really interesting. So the textbook starts with the lessons of Jesus' family tree, the lessons of Jesus' family tree. And the scripture that it points out is Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. <coughs> Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. Um, you can read it here on the side. I'll go ahead and make that available to you for you to read. But essentially, it talks about how there are no tribes with Jesus. The, the family tree that Matthew gives us, again, it's inclusive of everybody. It, it doesn't leave uh, anybody out. It's men, it's women, it's Jews, it's Gentiles, it's saints, it's sinners. It's everybody. There are no tribes with Jesus. Uh, from the very beginning, that was God's plan. That was his will. Uh, and he kind of shows that uh, throughout history with the people that he includes uh, in, his, uh, in the lineage of Jesus. Uh, all the, the players, all the persons that came together to make, uh, to make it happen, to make um, Jesus a royal descendant and also uh, a descendant of basically everybody. Uh, um, so we have that understanding. Um, again, uh, the, the textbook gives Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. So uh, we also see that everyone here is equal. And that, again, this is another thing that, that we mentioned earlier, uh, that in this particular uh, genealogy in Matthew, nobody is less than. Everybody's contribution 
is equal. Everybody's value is equal. Everybody's station is equal. Everybody's position is equal. So you have a woman like Rahab, who is a businesswoman, but also a prostitute, on the same level uh, as the men. And you have a, a foreigner like Ruth on the same level as the Jewish-born uh, 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 people in the line of Jesus. You have a, a woman who was wrapped up in scandal like Tamar, and her reputation is messed up, but she's still included in the line of Jesus. And so we see that God makes, Jesus comes to make everyone equal, to put everyone on the same footing, to put everyone on the same level. Um, and I think this is important to note because when we come to the Lord, when we come to Jesus, we shouldn't be treating people like they're less than. We shouldn't be treating uh, people that, that haven't come to the Lord as less than. Um, we have been lifted, we have been elevated through Jesus, and we should give the same respect to other people. We should never have that attitude that we're better than or greater than or, or, or more than or higher than somebody else. Um, Jesus takes everybody. He takes you regardless of gender, of race, of culture, or even of past. And so if we uh, aren't being looked down by God, if we aren't being looked down by Jesus, if we aren't being excluded uh, by our Savior, then we have no business looking down on anybody else. We have no business. Um, um, we have no business condemning anybody else. We have no business excluding anybody else. Um, Jesus includes everybody. Everybody that's willing to come, everybody that's willing to receive him is an equal uh, partaker of the blessing and of the family. Nobody is less than. And so it is a lesson to us to know that when we come into the body, we should never look down on others. We should never look down on those that are trying, those that are struggling, those that have pasts that maybe scare us or offend us or, or make us um, have uh, thoughts that we shouldn't be having about that person. Regardless of where that person came from, we should always treat them um, the same way that we've been treated, again, with love and with kindness and, and to see them as equals and not as less than. Um, the the um, textbook also tells us the story about John Newton. For those of you uh, who don't have the textbook, I'll go ahead and share the story of John Newton really quickly. He is the writer and the composer of Amazing Grace. Uh, from what we understand of his life, he was pretty stubborn. He was pretty rebellious. Um, he he ended up kind of uh, doing uh, odd jobs and working here and there before he um, ended up working on a slave ship. And he rose in the ranks uh, of that business until he owned his own slave ship and began to transport slaves uh, back and forth from Africa. Um, and so we see that at a certain point in his life, he actually ends up uh, um, getting saved. He ends up receiving Jesus. He ends up reading the Bible and he repents. He repents and he leaves behind his business. He leaves behind the slave trade. He leaves behind his old life. And he writes this beautiful hymn, uh, Amazing Grace. And so Again, it doesn't really matter what a person has done. It doesn't matter where they come from. Jesus has made room at the cross for all of us. Jesus has, from the very beginning, it's been his plan to exclude no one and accept all who are willing to accept him as, as their Lord and Savior. Uh, he accepts them uh, into the family, into our, our spiritual family and our church family. The other thing that the book talks about is two different truths. Uh, and we spoke a little bit about this last week. Um, but this week, uh, the book uh, helps us get into it a little bit more. What we see here uh, in particular is the name Jesus means Savior. And this is Matthew 1, uh, verse 21. Jesus, the actual name Yeshua uh, in Hebrew means Savior. And he's given this name because he's going to be the Savior of all. He's going to be... Uh, the one who rescues us, the one who redeems us, the one who takes us from where we are and elevates us to, to a heavenly place, to a position, again, in the family of God. Uh, I want to make a note here that on page 30 of, of the textbook, on page 30 it says, 
Jesus' mission is not only to save us from sin's penalty, but also from sin's power. Jesus' mission is not only to save us from sin's penalty, but also from sin's power. And I think this is a great note that the textbook makes because just, just the fact that he saves us from sin and the penalty of sin, which is death, that alone is amazing. But why would God save us from something and keep us in that in that thing? And that's one of the examples that the textbook uses. He's not going to save you from fire only to keep you in the fire. He's not going to save you from drowning in water only to keep you in that body of water. If he saves you from something, he's going to take you out of that thing. He's not going to keep you in it. He's going to save you out of it. So the idea that Jesus saves us should go beyond, yeah, Jesus saves me from sin and I'm not going to hell, I'm going to heaven. Uh, that That is only part of it. The other part of it is that he saves you from the power of sin, which means that he's giving you the capacity to overcome sin. He's giving you the capacity to say no. He's giving you the strength that you need to look at that temptation in the face and say, no, I don't think so. I'm not falling for you today. I'm not going to do it. This should be encouraging to all of us because so long as we're in this physical body, so long as we're still on the earth, we will struggle with sin. We will struggle with temptation. If you're a human being that is still on the earth and you're breathing air and you're alive, you will struggle at some point in time. You will struggle, even as a Christian, even as a saved person. There is nobody that is so holy or so uh, spiritually in tune that uh, with God that they will never uh, sin again or they will never uh, be tempted again. That's just not how how the reality is. And so this should be encouraging that uh, encouraging us that Jesus did not just save us from the penalty of sin, but He saves us from the power of sin. There's another quote here in the book uh, that I'll also post here on the side, and it says, if he saves us from something, he doesn't keep us in it. And again, that's exactly what I was saying. The next point or the next thing that the book looks at here is Jesus was born of a virgin. Um, so when, when the angel has this discussion uh, with Joseph and with Mary, uh, he basically mentions that, you know, he's going to be Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us. And so uh, the book talks about how, and, and again, I think this is a great point, how he's not only a man with us, he is God with us. And, and we have to remember that Jesus had to be both. Uh, in order to save humanity, he had to be 100% man. But in order to reconnect us to God and to be the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, he has to be 100% God. And so this is, this is, again, an encouragement to us to know that from the very beginning, God planned to be with us 100% as a man so that he could connect with us and understand us and, and, and intercede for us because he knows what it's like to be a human being, but also to be God, the literal, uh, living, breathing, almighty, all-powerful God living amongst us in the form of Jesus. So he was 100% man and 100% God. And he was born of a virgin. And he had to be born of a virgin in order for him to be 100% God. There is no way um, that, that Joseph could have been with Mary uh, uh, sexually and that that firstborn <clears throat> be the Messiah. It had to be part human or all human and all God. So that's uh, Mary's where he gets, obviously, the human part. And Holy Spirit coming upon Mary is, is where we get the God part. Um, so that's interesting to note. Um, the next thing that the book talks about is three attitudes toward Jesus, three attitudes uh, that people uh, or that groups of people took towards Jesus. The first one I want to talk about here that the book mentions is jealousy, an attitude of jealousy, and this led to opposition. Now, the example that the book pulls uh, is from Herod, and, and we spoke about this a little bit, how Herod may have been familiar with the Jewish scriptures. Of course, he had a relationship with the high priest. 
He had a relationship with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and, and the Jewish council uh, that was in charge of, of, of the Jews. So we know that he was familiar to a certain degree about the prophecies and about the scriptures. Um, but Herod here is, is motivated by jealousy. The, the historians from the historical uh, context and point of view know or, or, or have record of the kind of man that Herod was. He was so insecure about his position and so determined to hold on to the power that he had that he killed even his own sons. He killed his family members to make sure that he would not have to share his power with anyone. So when he hears the Magi saying, oh, the, uh, a child has been born that's going to be the king of the Jews, the reason that he sends the order to kill uh, this, these children is because he's insecure and he's jealous and he doesn't want to share power. I think that is so telling for those of us that are being motivated by jealousy to oppose someone or to oppose leadership or to oppose uh, the work of God in our lives. Whether God is speaking to us through our authorities, through our spiritual authorities, through our local churches, again, through our, our pastors and our church leadership, uh, whenever you, you have that thing on the inside of you that immediately wants to oppose or immediately wants to go against, you should examine yourself and see why do I feel this way? Why do I feel threatened? Why do I feel that I have to uh, uh, do something to jeopardize or, or to destabilize what God is doing or what my leadership is doing or what uh, my pastors are doing? You should examine yourself because you could be motivated by selfishness um, and by insecurity because that's really the root of jealousy is selfishness. The root of jealousy is insecurity. When you are, are all about yourself and what I want and what I need and, and when am I going to get mine and when, when, when is it going to happen to me and when is it going to come my way? Usually that will result in jealousy because you see somebody else getting what you want or having what you want or getting the position you want and you immediately begin to say things like, that's not of God, that's not right, they're totally wrong, but are they? I mean, <clears throat> if you are, are feeling insecure and you're feeling selfish, you might be dealing with jealousy. And you might be dealing uh, with something that is so rooted down on the inside of you that you can't even recognize that what is happening, the, the, the plan that is unfolding is of God. But you can't see it because you are, are jealous and you're, you're blinded by selfishness and what you want and what you want to have and where you want to be and where you want to go. Um, and it could be motivating or it could be compelling you to be rebellious or disobedient or to try to disrupt uh, the plans of your church or the plans of your leadership or the plans of your pastor uh, because in your mind it, it's not right uh, or, or you feel like you uh, are being left out or you feel like you're being excluded when truly this is God moving um, and you're just jealous. Um, the other attitude that's mentioned, remember there's three, so we spoke about jealousy. The next one is blindness, an attitude of blindness. And the, the study mentions that this leads us to, to ignoring or to avoiding what God is doing. Um, the, the, again, the Jewish council or the Jewish authorities uh, that were in power at the time, the, the, the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, a lot of them knew about the scriptures. They knew what was going to happen. They knew uh, about the prophecies. And when they heard about the Magi coming uh, and, and, and telling them, essentially, the Messiah has been born and asking, where can we find them? We see them pretty much indifferent. We see them pretty much not reacting. We see them pretty much ignoring what the Magi are doing and who the Magi are looking for. And so a lot of times... When we are blind, when we are ignorant, when we are outside of the will of God, we have a tendency to just avoid 
uh, where God is, avoid what God is doing, or, or, or try to ignore uh, what God is saying. Because the Magi were being used by God to speak to the priest. That should have been their, their wake-up call. That should have been their siren. That should have been uh, the sound going off to let them know that, hey, it's time. Get up. Go uh, and worship and honor and, and, and seek out uh, this, this Messiah, this King of the Jews. And yet they just pretended like they didn't hear it. They pretended like they didn't know. They pretended like it didn't matter. A lot of times, and again, if you're trying to figure out why someone is acting a certain way or why you're acting a certain way, if if someone is ignoring, if someone is avoiding church, avoiding the preaching, avoiding the teaching, ignoring what God is saying through pastor, through leadership, through the authorities, ignoring what God is doing uh, in their lives and in the lives of others, it's because they're blind. It's because they're outside of the will of God. Their heart is not in it. They might be hearing with their physical ears, but they're not hearing with their spiritual ears. They might be seeing with their physical eyes, but they're not seeing with their spiritual eyes. They have closed themselves off to the voice of God and the word of God. So if you see that God is moving and, and he's uh, changing and transforming and blessing, but this person seems to be oblivious. This person seems to be uh, out of the loop. It may be because that person is spiritually blind. They've closed their heart to what God is doing, and they've decided that they either want no part of it or they're just not interested in what God is doing. The last uh, attitude that the book talks to us about is worship, an attitude of worship. And this is demonstrated again through the Magi who were uh, being used by God. Um, so we see that the Magi worship and their worship leads to two different uh, actions on their part or reactions on their part. We see that worship leads them to pursuit. And so their desire to worship the king, their desire to honor the new king of the Jews, the Messiah, leads them on a journey. It compels them to pursue, uh, to find, to seek this king, to seek this child that has been born. And a true worshiper should always be hungry. That's what seeking is. When you're seeking something, it's because you're hungry to know what it is. You're hungry to find it. You're, you're thirsty uh, to have that knowledge or to have that experience or to have that time uh, um, with God, uh, particularly as a worshiper of God. Your worship is a sign that you're hungry. Your worship is a sign that you're thirsty. And if you are a true worshiper, you will be compelled to pursue God no matter what it takes. Remember the Magi came from the East. They came from miles away. I mean, they traveled for months, more than likely for months from the East coming uh, to, to Israel to find uh, the, the child that had been born. Um, that pursuit is something that you have to commit yourself to. That, that pursuit is something that you have to dive into and you have to say, no matter how hard it is, no matter how long it takes, I want to see God. I want to, to hear him. I want to engage with him. I want to be in a real, active, passionate relationship with him. And so true worship leads you to a pursuit of God. The other thing that we see uh, here with the, the attitude of worship as displayed through the Magi is that they give uh, uh, the best that they have to give. Gold was not a cheap thing. Myrrh was not a cheap oil. Uh, incense was not a, a cheap offering. Those were all very expensive, very luxurious, very lucrative gifts that they gave. And so true worship often compels us to give our best. Your worship and your giving go hand in hand. They are connected. And so we see this also in the New Testament, uh, um, in, in the story of Cornelius. Uh, and I might 
put it here on the side so that you can look at that story. But uh, in that particular story, we find Cornelius, who is a Gentile um, and who has a, a, a family um, that is serving. He, I guess he's serving uh, within a Jewish community, so much so to the point that the Jews actually revere him. They love him. He's beloved. He works on behalf of the Jews. He defends the Jews. Uh, he has believed in the Jewish God, so he has invested his time, his, his energy, his worship in, in God, uh, Je Jehovah. He, he also uh, brings offerings before the Lord on a regular basis, which means that he gives on a regular basis before the Lord. And it is his worship mixed with his giving that finally reaches the nostrils of God and, and, and becomes a memorial before the Lord. And the scripture says that the Lord uh, remembered Cornelius. And because Cornelius wasn't a Jew and Cornelius hadn't heard about Jesus, the, the Lord sends uh, Peter to go talk to Cornelius, share with him about Jesus. And as, uh, they re as they're hearing about Jesus, they not only receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, but Cornelius and his entire family uh, instantaneously are baptized uh, in the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak other tongues. I mention this story because Cornelius is, is yet another example, like the Magi, that God will use anyone who is willing, anyone with an open heart, anyone who wants more of God will receive more of God. And, and the example that the Magi and that Cornelius said is that worship and giving are intertwined. Whenever you give, I also just want to make a note that whenever you give, giving is not about a certain amount. Giving, about, giving is about your best. So if all you have to give is your time, give your time, invest it in your local church or, or a ministry uh, that you know about that you can connect with and you can volunteer. If all you have to give is your talent, give your talent. If all you have to give is your money, give your money. Whatever it is you have to give, if it's two cents or or two million, it doesn't matter, everything in between so long as it's your best, give, because your giving is connected with your worship, and one should lead to the other. When you, when you worship, it should compel you to give, and when you give, it should be a part of your worship. Remember, it's not about quantity, it's about giving your best. And don't expect anything in return. When Cornelius was, was serving the people of God and when he was offering uh, the offerings before the Lord, he wasn't doing it so that he could get something in return. When the Magi offered their, their gifts to the child Jesus, they did not give it to Jesus and then ask for something in return. You are giving because you love God and because you want to worship. Your giving is an act of worship. So when you serve, when you play your instrument, when you sing, when you volunteer, when you clean, when you teach, when you preach, when you give your very best to God, or if it's money, you give it without expecting anything in return. You give it because you realize it is an act of worship. The last thing that the textbook talks about is the Nazarene years. Um, and this is not a, a, a very uh, in-depth study. You can read it in the textbook if you like. Uh, you can also read it in the scriptures uh, as well. Uh, but essentially what the textbook covers, and I think it's just a good point to make here, is that Jesus was a common man. You know, a lot of us think about Jesus only within the context of his ministry. So those three years from about the age of 30 to about 33, where we see his life uh, exposed through the Gospels, uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, we see him doing wonders. We see him doing signs. We see him doing miracles. He's, he's always treating people with kindness and respect and, and gentleness. He is the example that God has given us, and he's, he's perfect. I mean, he has to be in order to be the Lamb of God. But just because he's perfect doesn't mean that he wasn't common in, in this sense. For the first 30 years of his life, he lived as a regular working Joe, just like you and me. 
He was a carpenter. He learned that trade from his father. We know that by the time he's 30, his father's no longer in the picture, which means that he probably died, which means that as the oldest son of his mother, he was supporting the family. He was supporting the house. He was supporting probably his brothers and sisters, those that hadn't uh, gone off to get married. He was the one that was supporting them. So that means for the first 30 years, guess what he did? He sat down at a table and he ate. He drank food. Uh, he he drank he drank water. Uh, he he went to to the synagogue. He went he went to church. He you know went to to the different events in the community. He spoke with his neighbors. He had friendly conversations with passerbys in the street. He went to the market. He bought food. He worked. He was a carpenter. For 30 years, he lived a regular life, like a regular man. So when, when the word tells us that Jesus can understand us, it's because he can. What we read in the Gospels are only the last three years of his life, his three years of ministry. That's what we read. And, and we, we need to remind ourselves that all of the things that he did are amazing and all the things that he did are incredible. And we're going to get into his teachings and the signs and the wonders and the miracles later on in this study. But I want you to remember that the reason that he's the perfect lamb of God and the last sacrifice that was ever needed is not just because he served in ministry for three years and did signs, wonders, and miracles. It's because for the first 30 years of his life, he lived a regular a regular life, like a regular man, doing his best to honor his Father in heaven and his and 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 the job that he was sent here to do. He he was living and working just like you and me, and so I think that's a really great point that the book makes. That is the end of this lesson, and that is the end of part three. Next week, we are going to move on to chapter two, chapter two. Uh, so next week, we're looking at chapter two, the early Judean ministry of Jesus. Again, uh, we're still taking rather large chunks of the book, so we're going to do our best to break those down uh, into palpable uh, uh, studies. Like I said, we're going to try and keep it to about 30 minutes. Uh, I will put the scriptures up here so that you can study ahead of time. We're looking uh, for the entire chapter, the early Judean ministry of Jesus. We're looking at Matthew chapter 3, verses 1, all the way to chapter 4, verses 22. We're looking at Mark. We're finally getting into Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 13, and then Luke chapter 3, verses 1, all the way to Luke chapter 4, verse 10, verse 13. That is the entire chapter. Remember, we're breaking these up into small pieces. For the lesson, so for chapter 2, lesson 1, the title of the lesson is The King's Messenger and Baptism. The King's Messenger and Baptism. And the scriptures that we'll be looking at just for lesson 1 is Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 17, and Mark chapter 1, verses 2 to 11, and Luke chapter 3, verses 2 to 22. Thanks so much for joining us again. I'm so glad that you're sticking uh, sticking with us as we go uh, through these lessons. Thank you so much for bearing with us. Remember to subscribe. When you subscribe, go ahead and hit the notification bell so that way you know when new videos are posted. And uh, also friend us and follow us on Facebook. Uh, as always, Noe Hernandez, CC Emanuel. All the information is at the bottom. Uh, hope to see you back next week. Bye.